Every now and then we get the wonderful opportunity to stay in one book of the Bible. And so it is for the month of May, we find ourselves in Acts. And the beauty of Acts is it's the beginning of the early church community. And so the theme for this month is the call. Each Sunday I will be focused on a different call, but the overall theme and series is the call of God on our lives. So good to have you all here today on this first Sunday of May. And the theme or sermonic theme for today is the call you never got. The call you never got. At the age of 14, Brian Widener became a skinhead. He had become a chronic runaway and was living on the streets. It got to the point where his dad would say, hey, call me every two weeks. Let me know that you're still alive. He lived in a town in Albuquerque, New Mexico that was predominantly Mexican, and he recalls that white boys often got their butts kicked. He remembers getting beat up and bullied a lot. He learned early that in order to survive, you had to become mean and hard on the outside. He had a relative who was a skinhead and decided, hey, he needed somewhere to fit in. It seemed natural to him that the next step in his life would be to become a skinhead. By the time he was 19, he was tattooed up and was now the one who people feared. He said at first it kind of gave him a joy that people, instead of him being afraid of people, it kind of had turned around and people seemed to be afraid of him. He got swastikas tattoos for shock value and he said it was effective. But it also got him into a lot of fights because <laughs> people would see and have a reaction. Looking back, he says, when you have a kid who hates himself and is struggling, it's easy to convince him that minorities are his problem. Brian belonged to several factions and was effective at organizing and building up hate groups. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. When folks are spreading a message of hate, there is usually more that meets the eye going on. There generally is some pain, some hurt involved. Hurt people generally kind of hurt other people. That's the way it goes. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Paul really does not like Jesus' people. He threatens them. He is letting them have it. He goes after them. He locks them up. He seeks them out. He was an enemy of Christ's followers. He would search out followers, tie and bind them, and once arresting them, bring them before the authorities in Jerusalem. This was no subtle dislike. He really could not stand them. I knew this pastor once who really persecuted the LGBTQ community. It's one thing to be against something, but his passion and rigor were alarming. Most people did not say anything back. Whenever, however, he got on the topic, it became very, very legalistic. You could feel the tension in the room. Well, some decades later, I learned something about my colleague that I had not known back in the day. I learned his own battle with his own sexuality. I learned he belonged to a group of men that prayed to be delivered of this energy. I learned whether it had been, whether it had been successful for him or not. Suddenly, his fury sermons against gays made more sense. When someone is adamantly against or pursuing another person or group, there's always more than meets the eye to that story. Jesus got this when he says to Paul, Saul, why do you give me such a hard time? Why? And at that moment, Paul is blind. He is overwhelmed by the presence of Jesus asking him a heart of the matter question. Why do you hate those who work for me so much? What is going on with you, Paul? What is this all about? Why do you give so much energy to certain kinds of people? Why do you always get angry with these people? What have they done to you? What's it all about? The question stopped Paul right in his tracks. He has a real coming to self moment. People say you can come to Jesus, but it's kind of good to come to yourself sometimes. <laughs> Why do I do the things I do? And for three days, he existed without sight, not being able to eat or drink. 
All of us have been hurt. All of us have felt betrayed or misunderstood. Jesus had the biggest betrayal of all just a few weeks ago before Easter, but it's what we do with that pain that matters. Just begin reading Will Smith's memoir, Will. And in it, he talks about his father being so violent and having so much anger and being a veteran. And he said all of him and his siblings handled it differently. His brother was a fighter. He would fight right back. His sister fled. And Will will turn to comedy. We do the best with what we got. And sometimes we find ourselves looking dead smack in the face at ourselves and hearing the question, why? Why did you do that? Why are you harming others? Doctors take a Hippocratic oath found in the Greek medical text to do no harm. And yet, maybe we all should take an oath to do no harm. Why do we often harm and hurt each other? We do it, I think, out of pain and hurt. I will remember one colleague saying, you hurt me and I'm gonna hurt you. I'm gonna try to hurt you just as bad as you've hurt me, if not more. Truth is the church has done its share historically of harm and hurt, not only historically, but really in the present as well. Imagine the shock that greeted Paul when he got the call he never got in his life with the question, why are you hurting my people? Why are you doing this? Brian says at some point being a skinhead stopped being enough. He says he always believed being a skinhead meant love of family and lifting up the women as their queens. But what he saw hurt him. Men were beating their wives and women were not taking care of their kids. He became depressed and would drink as many as 30 beers a day. He didn't see a way out. He knew if he tried to exit, he would be killed. You do not walk away from being a skinhead as involved as he was and return to a normal wife, a normal life. He admits to harming others, and yes, he admits there were even murders. The words of Tracy Chapman seem to echo Brian's disposition, and maybe so, maybe many of ours. I want to wake up and know where I'm going. Again and again as I travel around, I am stunned by how many citizens in our nation feel lost feel bereft of a sense of direction, feel as though they cannot see where our journeys lead, that they cannot know where they are going. The beginning to this call some have never gotten is to acknowledge where we are and go from there, to sit with our pain and our hurt. Don't share it, don't spread it. This story does not end for Paul here, glory be to God. No matter how wrong we are, we can always return day by day brick by brick. Will also shares in his memoir, his dad had them build this wall. All they could see was the wall. It took them what would take skilled people two days, a year to build. One day Will says, I felt like giving up and my dad could see it. And his dad yelled, stop looking at the wall. Just lay one brick. And suddenly the thing that felt impossible was possible. Will said, I can, I can lay one brick. And so they laid one brick perfectly after another. Every year there is a draft season in sports. Teams switch out players that may not be doing well and they try to get new ones that will make their team even a better team. You guys already know I love Chicago Sky WNBA. This year I wasn't surprised that they traded out Diamond DeShields. She just wasn't performing as well as she had. But to be honest, it hurt because when I first started the game, there was Diamond, and it felt like we had been in this thing together. But we also got some new players, and last year, one of those players was our own Candace Parker, who took us to our first championship win. In this story, Paul switches team. He goes from being on one team to playing for the other. In response to getting the call he never got, he changes teams, and he changes his life. Maybe it feels like him and Brian, they're so drastic, they're different from our own lives. But this is not just about us. It's recognizing in others, especially when it, they kind of tee us off, when we see hate and meanness, that perhaps there's more to the story. 
Perhaps we are called as followers of Christ to see beyond like Christ saw beyond, to see beyond hate and, and meanness, to see the spiritual bonds that hold people hostage. It is also a call to check ourselves, because sometimes we need to be checked. Sometimes we are out of order. It is also a call not to be pulled into our own pain and hurt that causes us to harm others, not for one second. You know, there is this little um, icon story where the dad had a bad day and he was mean to the wife and the wife was mean to one of the kids and one of the kids was mean to the other kid and then that kid was mean to another kid and then that kid kicks the dog. You get where I'm going here with this? You know how like hurt and meanness you shared and then somebody else shares it and it keeps trickling right on down. Brian changes teams too. As Brian was changing, his circumstances were not changing at all. He bore a face of hate. He couldn't get a job. Whenever people saw him, the first thing that they saw was hate. And so he couldn't take care of his family. He reached out to a group that he formerly persecuted, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and said, I need help with getting these tattoos off my face. And they took his case on. He realized if he was ever going to have a chance at a new life and playing for a new team, the tattoos with the swastikas on them were going to have to go. He did the first couple of laser treatments without anesthesia. He said it was the most excruciating pain he had been through in his life. It took 24 separate procedures to lift the tattoos just off his face and his neck. Over two years to get off hate. He got married to a wife who was also waking up. He had a kid, and he decided he wanted more for his kid. That happens often when people become parents. He reached out to anti-racist activist Daryl Jenkins, and he said, hey, man, help me get out of this. For two years straight, he got death threats, phone calls, threatening to kill him and his family. And his last stop, do you know where his last stop was? It was the church. His father-in-law had been inviting him and his daughter down to Tennessee to his church. And when they went to this church, they felt the power of the Spirit. And then he got the call he never got in that church, a commitment and a relationship to Christ. The path to healing and to being our best version never happens alone in a bubble. We all need each other on this journey. Even as our world tries to spread the message more and more that we can do this alone, we need each other. Paul, Saul, and Brian needed community, and so do we. The call some of you have never gotten is simple. It's a part of being of service to others, but making sure that you are well yourself. Sometimes we serve and we're not in a good place ourselves. A person I once knew used to say, if the plane is going down, Charlene, who are you going to put the oxygen mask on first? And his answer was, put the oxygen mask on yourself. This got passed down to him from his dad, and he preached it everywhere. You see, the answer is self. We have to take care of ourselves. Playing on God's team means you have to be healthy and ready to work. God's team is being sent. We learned on last Sunday the benediction that God's team is being sent into the world every week to be agents of lights and messengers of hope. Prayer and forgiveness have to be daily acts in our life. Checking our heart has to be a daily act. Dealing with hurt is a daily act. Looking at the human in the mirror is a daily act. And when your vision is impacted, Receive it as an invitation from God to sit still for a few days. Knowing when you're hurt is a daily act. Not taking it out on others is a daily act. Being a part of a faith community that nurtures and holds you accountable is a daily act. We cannot do this by ourselves. Paul couldn't and Brian couldn't. The call you never got is to exist healthy with others, to leave this world in a better place than we found it, in a better condition than we found it. Amen.